Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at my thoughts on the Prusa i3 Mark III. I've had it for around six months, so that does in fact make me slower at reviews than make his muse. So it's about time I give you my views. Let's take a look. So what is the Prusa i3 Mark III? which I will now refer to as the Mark III throughout the rest of the video to prevent me having to say i3 Mark III again and again and again. The Mark III is an FDM printer with a build volume of 250 by 210 by 210 for a total of 11,025 cm cubed. It's capable of printing PLA, ABS, ASA, PTG, hips, flexibles, nylon, bronze fill, carbonates, etc. and more, but bear in mind to print those more complicated filaments, you are going to need some sort of enclosure or a harder nozzle. It utilizes a 1.75 millimeter filament through a 0.4 millimeter E3D hot end and nozzle, driven by a pair of Bontech extruder gears. The printer is controlled via an INZ Rambo control board, which utilizes TMC2130 stepper drivers, which are capable of 256th micro stepping. The extensive list of other features includes a removable magnetic PEI and spring steel build plate, automatic mesh bed leveling, power loss recovery, skip step detection, filament sensor, low overall printer noise and up to 200 millimeters a second print speed. In the box, in addition to all the parts needed to build the Mark III, you'll find a kilogram of PLA filament, an acupuncture needle for cleaning the nozzle, isopropyl alcohol wipes, some basic tools, very basic, glue stick, USB cable, a Mark III printer handbook, and some Haribo, which are absolutely essential for building the printer. So now let's get on to the actual review. This will probably be quite a long video, so for the different categories or different stages of the review, I'll give some timestamps in the description below. Let's start with the build process. The Prusa took me nine and a half hours to build, which is quite long, but I did it on stream, so if you're experienced with building, it will probably take you around four to six hours. The build itself is fairly simple and it's safe, so it's fine for inexperienced builders or young people being supervised by adults. The only skills you really need to be able to build this printer are a bit of patience, the ability to read a manual that comes in multiple languages, and a little bit of manual dexterity for the finer details. The build process takes you through step by step these numbered bags which put everything in the order that you need them and makes it really easy to get the parts that you need. It's not just one big pile of stuff that you've got to search through all the time. Also, compared to the Mark IIs, they've made a significant reduction in the number of different screws. So most of the screws, I mean like most, not all of them and not all the time, but most of the time, the, end, the screws are M3 by 10. So there's not very much to do in terms of making sure you find the right screw. They're normally like all the same length. So that's really useful. The manual itself comes in a number of languages, as I've already mentioned, which is great for multinational use. And there are also a number of comments on the online manual. So if you're a little bit stuck, check what the comments say. There might already be added solutions to the problems that you're having or the slight issue you have with maybe fitting one piece into the other, someone will give you some advice. Some of the downsides of the build process is that there's no five and a half mil wrench for doing nylock nuts. You have to use pliers, which is really not the right tool. Uh, it comes with zip ties still. Um, by this stage, I'd expect them to have got rid of zip ties, but as I said, still a number of those. I did need to adjust some of the parts during fitting them. So a little knife just to get some of the edges off in places where nuts don't quite fit and things like that. But hopefully, seeing as that was like the very first units, those problems should have been sorted by now. And lastly, the Z-axis uh, covers. Yeah, didn't really enjoy that process. I'd like them to be like maybe two piece or I don't know, maybe something just simpler. They're not very pleasant to put on, but again, not the end of the world. Just be careful and try not to push too hard. At the end of the build process, make sure you update the firmware and do your self-test with the wizardy thing that it guides you through all the way. Talking of firmware, let's have a look at the sort of firmware and control on the printer. All the control is done via an LCD panel, which eh, is a little bit on the dated side. It does bring this sort of quintessential rep wrap thing to the printer, this style of DIY, but really I'd like to see something a little bit more advanced. The firmware update process is pretty easy. You just plug it in via USB, run the software, load the file that you download from their website, and it's pretty much jobs are good at. When you do that, make sure that you have the printer plugged in. If you try and do it while you don't have the power plugged into the power and turned on, then it just won't work and it might all crash and go a little bit weird. So make sure you don't forget the power cable and turn it on. 
for running the prints, you're pretty much stuck with tethered or SD card. You can fit a Raspberry Pi Zero to the back of the control board and run through Octoprint, but there have been a number of issues with that. Tethered, really not a good idea, especially if you're running Windows 10 and it likes to do updates at all sorts of weird moments. Uh, so SD card is probably your most suitable option for this printer. So speaking of printing, what is the print quality like? Well, in front of me, you can see a number of prints of the printer. I've obviously printed a lot more than this, but this is what I've got to show you today. We have things like ASA, PETG, and PLA. It comes with a roll of PLA, and that's what all this silver is. See a number of prints that I've done with that. The print quality, I would say, is well above average, but it's definitely not the best I've seen. It has had some issues over time, such as the soft stainless steel rails and the current issue, which I've posted a video about recently. But other than that, the print quality is generally very good. Some of the downsides of the print quality is that the ghosting does seem quite bad. A lot of these prints that we get as samples, they're mostly curvy edges and you don't get that ghosting effect. But when you're printing mechanical parts with sharp corners, that ghosting does become a little bit more obvious. I think that is partly down to the silence of the printer, so the rubber feet that cause a bit more wobble generally seems to cause a little bit more ghosting, but it's, it's not that bad. It's worse, probably worse than average, but not the worst. The 200 millimeters per second print speed is quite exciting, but also a little bit misleading. For new starters in the 3D printing world, which Prusa is arguably one of the best printers for, it indicates as an upgrade from the Mark IIs to the Mark III, the maximum speed changes from 100 millimeters a second to 200 millimeters a second, and therefore sort of implies that the, the print is twice as fast and takes half as long. While yes, it can print at up to 200 millimeters a second, don't expect it to be whizzing across your bottom layers at 200 millimeters, millimeters a second and finishing your prints in half the time. It just doesn't work like that. The part cooling fan is vastly better than the Mark II, as it has a sort of semicircle, so it's cooling from most of the sides. There is still some issue with cooling from the back, and it seems to limit on something like a uh, Maker's Muse torture cube. There is generally one side, the rear side, that does have a little bit of droop on the overhangs because the cooling can't get to that area as effectively. But other than that, the print cooling fan is pretty good. So the print quality can be fairly good. It's definitely above average. But that counts for nothing if only one in 10 prints actually makes it off the printer in something more than a big blob of molten plastic. So what's the consistency like? <laughs> so what's the consistency like? Well, for the first few months of this printer, I had literally zero errors, zero failures, zero missed failed prints. Anything that did fail was because I was deliberately trying to torture the printer and move things and take, pull the power out and stuff like that. The downside of that such good reliability is that you tend to shy away from every other printer you own. The only downside I've had in consistency is with large prints. The mesh bed leveling doesn't seem to really level all that well. So I'll end up having, for a large print, it being sort of okay in the middle and okay on one side, and then on the other side it'll just be sort of not sticking. With all this talk about printing, how do you actually get it onto the printer? Well, of course, you use the software that comes with it. You've got Slicer or Slick 3R Prusa Edition, or Prusa Control. Starting with Slick 3R, I'd say it's a very impressive piece of software. It's basically Slick 3R with a slight Prusa skin with all the Prusa profiles embedded, which is useful because then you don't have to mess around with all your little profiles to get your things all just right. There is still a little bit of tweaking to do when you get the printer. Over a period of time, I'm sure you'll develop your own profiles that are very similar, but slightly adjusted, especially if you have your own materials that are not already in their database. Prusa Control is one of the pieces of software that has really surprised me. I expected, because it's sort of beginner level, that it would work okay for basic prints, but when you start to do things any bit more complicated and you think normally you'd wanna, maybe I'll add a bigger brim or I'll do this or I'll do that, but it just seems to print okay. I mean, there's no major problems with Prusa con Prusa Control. Though I think the best thing about it is its suitability for beginners. Slicer, Slick 3R, is an excellent piece of software, but can look a little intimidating if you're new to 3D printing. Prusa Control has that sort of level of user interface that allows beginners to just get into it. They can, if they don't wanna tweak all the settings and stuff, they can just stick it in, export it, jobs are good. It will probably be fine for whatever they need. As they develop more advanced knowledge about 3D printing, they can move forward to the more advanced software. 
At the end of the day, they're basically the same piece of software with a slightly different skin. Let's move on now to the slightly more special things about the Prusa. The removable bed, the skip step detection, the power failure recovery, and all that sort of stuff. My favorite by far is the removable bed. It's 3D printing without a bed like this is just crazy. You don't have to hack at anything to get it off. You just print it on a nice flat surface, bend, put it back. It's so easy to get prints off that anything else just becomes a little bit silly. With power loss recovery, my situation here in the United Kingdom is that power loss at households is very rare. I mean, it's so rare that when it does happen, we all like to get out loads of candles and pretend it's some sort of spooky party, just because it's interesting that we've lost power. That feature, while nice, is not something that I don't think I'm ever going to actually use, which is unfortunate because it's quite cool. The filament sensor, while fairly good, is not as reliable as it needs to be in order for me to completely rely on it. I wouldn't trust it at this point 100% to detect everything that I want it to detect. For example, it's supposed to, when you put the filament at the top, start turning the wheels and doing the load procedure to load the filament into the hot end. But if you put it in slightly too quick, then it doesn't detect it. So you're just like putting it in and oh no, I have to do it really slowly. And then it beeps because it's detected it. And then it's going in. It's like, I mean, it's good, but it's not spot on. So it just makes it a little bit irritating sometimes. In terms of detecting when you get to the end of a roll and it just, you watch the filament go slightly down and then into there and then detect. You think, oh, thank God. It stopped the print. But again, if you're not there to watch it, then... How are you gonna change the filament? And if you are there to watch it, how did you not see it or know that it was getting to the end? You know, it's just little things like that. You think, well, the feature's great, but how does the implementation really help me? And lastly, the support. When your printer is quite expensive relative to other ones of similar design, but obviously inferior, it's quite nice to know that you're getting some other things sort of behind the scenes that you'll need, but won't necessarily think about at the time of purchase. For example, when things go wrong, it's nice to know that you can contact Prusa support and they'll be able to help you. The only thing I've actually used them for is when the Prusa was delivered, the rods were stainless steel, which was not hard enough and it ended up with grooves. As a result, I took some pictures, contacted Prusa support and they said, hello, how can I help you? I said, they've got some rods, they look like they're too soft because they've got grooves in. They said, send some pictures and we'll send you some rods. So I sent some pictures and they sent me some rods that were hardened and much better. They actually sent bearings as well, which is great. So while it's nice to not have to contact support because the printer's working perfectly, it's nice to know that if something goes wrong, even if it was your own fault, Pusha are there to help you solve it, even if you have to pay for the parts because you damaged it yourself. Overall, the Prusa support is quite satisfying, but it's probably better for the inexperienced user that needs that level of support than the experienced one that might find it sort of a little bit patronizing. But it's good that it's there. So all in all, the Prusa i3 Mark III is a good printer, but there are some outdated features like the LCD screen, some undelivered ones like the powder coated bed, and some other issues that are still popping up six months after release, such as the print defects, which I made a, pretty, a video about recently. That being said, for a beginner, I do believe that this is still an excellent printer. It has a lot of features that are, well, just being introduced in this sort of popular sense, to the 3D printing community, like the filament sensor, the power loss recovery, and the stool guard, which really need to be on more printers. As for the detachable bed, any printer that doesn't have that on, I'm probably not gonna bother using, because it just seems crazy to just stick something to a bed, which you then have to hack off with something sharp. It just seems a little bit dumb at this point. So yes, the Prusa i3 is an excellent printer. Is it worth the price that you have to pay for it above other slightly lower cost and more basic printers. It depends entirely on your use case. If you're new to 3D printing and you have the money for a Prusa, it's probably the best bet to get started. But that being said, it is quite a high price premium for something that you're just sort of dipping your toe in the water. So that's it for me today on the Prusa i3 Mark III. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and you want to see more. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter where I do post content, images about what I'm doing behind the scenes. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.